Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Bryn O'Donnell slash occasionally go by Steph Magdalinski uh, with the Filecoin Foundation and Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web. Uh, and we are here today to talk about the D-Web in your back pocket. We have some fantastic FFDW nonprofit project partners that you're going to hear from today. And so maybe to kick us off, if each of you could give us a two minute introduction to who you are, the projects you work for, and how you are leveraging decentralized technologies. Okay. Two minutes each, those yes. are big questions. Yes, okay, hi, my name is Madeline DeFigueredo. I am the program manager with Open Archive. Um, we run in a mobile archive, a secure mobile archiving app called Save, and my role is basically deploying the app in uh, decentralized archivist communities around the world. And we just launched a research project this summer um, where we're going to begin investigating what types of decentralized backends are going to be the best fit for our community. So that in 2024, we're going to integrate um, a new decentralized. Uh, like protocol into our app directly so that our communities will have access to even more secure mobile archiving. Hi, uh, my name is Jack Fox Keen. I use they them pronouns and I am uh, the data empowerment lead for Proof Mode's Guardian project. Um, so uh, I uh, thought I'd give a little, back, bit, little bit of background about myself. So I actually came from a biomathematics and scientific computing background um, at Florida State University. And I focused a lot on computational neuroscience, um, specifically with mental health research and suicide prevention. Then I kind of pivoted over to machine learning, um, continuing my train of thought uh, around suicide prevention. Um, and then after that, I started doing, um, once I graduated, I started doing data analytics for nonprofits and um, NGOs. And Guardian Project is kind of like an NGO, where Guardian Project is a collective of developers and designers and community leaders um, and hackers who are all working together to create um, uh, encrypted apps for people who care about privacy, journalists, activists, humanitarians, um, people in different environments, anybody who cares about privacy. You don't need to be an activist to use our app. Um, but if you care about privacy, you might want to use our apps. Um, and so I specifically work on proof mode, which is a way of taking encrypted verifiable photos. Um, so um, yeah, so we work a lot with different human rights campaigns. Um, we are starting um, different projects also that are just kind of kind of a way of us challenging Google Earth, which I'll talk about more um, as we go on through the, the, the panel. Um, but yeah, that is my introduction, and I'm going to pass it on. Hello, my name is Benedict. Um, I'm, <clears throat> I'm the CTO at uh, Starling Lab. Uh, we are a lab that operates out of Stanford and USC. And I also have my colleagues here, uh, Yurko and Lindsay. Um, so the type of work that we do is uh, around data integrity. What this means is making sure that from the capture stage of uh, important digital assets, uh, we have provenance information so then they cannot be tampered. And then we also prototype uh, new, new ways of uh, pr preservation to make sure that our archives are resilient and uh, of course like not to be tampered with. Um, the way that we do this work is uh, in partnership with many um, news organizations, specifically like in the investigative area. Um, and also like um, so some work that we'll probably talk about later, uh, uh, some work in Ukraine where we document some of the human rights violations and also um, uh, looking at uh, uh, better ways of capturing um, content that's already on the web. Uh, a lot of web archiving work uh, that we work with, uh, for example, Web Recorder, uh, companies who are developing web scraping technologies um, and all this stuff to enable like uh, a reliable collection of ev evidence that sometimes when you um, um, take these archives, you don't know how, when they'll be needed in, in a court, for example, that might have a trial 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, and how do you ensure that um, there's provenance information to, uh, to, your, to your screenshots, you know? Like, we want something better than just a, just a screenshot of a, of a Twitter feed, and, um, and also how do you ensure that the metadata is intact uh, from the point of capture? Um, so that's the type of work we do, and we use uh, we actually use uh, proof mode quite a bit in multiple contexts. Uh, so, well, I guess that's the intro, but hopefully we'll talk more about that. Most certainly, we're going to dive into that. Steph and I are going to do a little swap now, um, but I'm going to keep us talking while we do that swap because I know we're running a little bit behind. And so in keeping with the theme of the D-Web in your back pocket, 
we want to talk about mobile applications. Many of you are looking at human rights uh, uses of decentralized mobile applications. So if you could tell us a little bit more about how slash why mobile phones are specifically a powerful tool for eyewitnesses. Yeah, um, thank you, Brim. Um, so for us, we tend to work in communities that are facing uh, human rights conflict and crisis. So we often find that mobile phones are a really accessible way for eyewitnesses, citizen journalists, and others to document what's happening on the ground, and that they can be able to kind of be empowered to share that information and contribute to an archive that will hold perpetrators to account or be able to advance evidence in other ways. Um, a more recent example of this is that we have a decentralized archivist community now in Sudan. Um, and in April, there was an escalating conflict where they faced internet outages, censorship, and a ongoing refugee crisis. Um, so having the ability for citizens on the ground, activists, journalists locally, to be able to document what was happening and then in a secure uh, way upload that information so that it could be used to um, not just inform the community but also shape the ways that policies were created and the human rights response um, was really essential. And we find that like being able to tie um, these technologies specifically to phones means that accessibility and usability kind of moves to the forefront of, of many of our kind of applications. Um, yeah, so um, I um, very, very similar uh, thoughts to Madeline um, around this topic. So, you know, there's this really great book by Mark Lamont Hill um, called Seen and Unseen. And it's about the power of citizen journalism that gave, that gave rise to the Black Lives Matter movement of 2020 specifically. Um, so, you know, it was, it was a person who took a video on their smartphone of the murder of George Floyd that was the evidence that was needed to hold um, that person accountable for murdering George Floyd. Um, and it was what sparked an entire movement um, that lasted for, you know, months. Um, and so, you know, it just kind of dives into this historical need, um, and it, he, he does a great job of going into the historical trend of, um, um, uh, you know, uh, people who, um, I forget the name of the person right now, but it was, um, I think it was Ida B. Wells, um, who uh, documented uh, the lynchings of African Americans in um, the uh, uh, early, uh, you know, after the Civil War, um, and was basically like, hey, like, this is happening. Like, I'm, I'm a citizen journalist, I am collecting this data, I am documenting, you know, what is happening to my people, um, because the, um, the, you know, obviously the police didn't care, um, and the governments didn't care, and so she actually started publishing stories um, as a you know as a journalist about why we should care about this. So you know, citizen journalism has a long history of you know basically getting governments to take actions that they need to take. Um, and then we also have citizen science um, that's being used um, with uh, cell phones as well. So we have indigenous groups in the Amazon that are documenting um, you know the effects of climate change. They're documenting the effects of deforestation, um, and they're documenting you know they're they're documenting their plants. They're documenting their fauna and flora. Um, and so just really empowering people to have tools to be able to verify these photos, to verify this evidence, um, is really important for both citizen journalists and citizen science, um, and just, you know, helping people be good citizens in general. Yeah, for, for sure I agree with um, the phone being like a great platform, because uh, everyone has it, it's decentralized in that way. Um, but uh, in, in, uh, in our collaborations with like professional photojournalists, it's really the combination of the phone and other ca uh, professional cameras and, and their existing workflow that really adds trust to our data sets. Um, so what, one example is uh, uh, connectivity between uh, of having, a, having a mobile phone that uses all the sensors to collect like the, the environmental uh, information, all the metadata, like GPS location, that sort of stuff alongside um, a professional camera, the like Canon camera that's tethered to the phone, and then using the, the, the combined uh, setup to, uh, to take photos. And, and this adds a layer of provenance to the photos that are, that, that are uploaded. Um, and then after this, um, once we have um, once we have these photos, we, we, we link them with pictures that are taken by uh, citizens. And then that whole archive uh, 
as trust to the to the data because like you now have multiple observers um, like institutions and uh, regular citizens that are observing an event like happening right beside them that adds a lot of trust it's like think about this compared to uh, like a captured screenshot on, 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 the, on the tweet this is like a lot more trustworthy and we want to make sure that we can like snapshot all this information and and make a permanent copy of it Okay, thank you. Firstly, apologies to everyone. I thought I was wandering over nice 20 minutes early for my 4.15 start of this panel rather than 10 minutes late for the 4.45. And thank you, Bryn, for stepping in and covering for my hopelessness. Um, so, uh, so we now have, everyone, we have th these recording devices. Everyone's out there. They're filming stuff. You know, they, we, we have this kind of chain of custody going on. But we also have coming up like this rampant new form of disinformation and, and deep fakes and, uh, and AI generated uh, kind of refutations of that kind of stuff. Um, with that kind of increasing lack of trust in the videos that are being captured um, and, uh, and posted social media, is this creating like a danger for the eyewitnesses and the people um, and the journalists, you know, using your tools? And have you had any kind of uh, attempts to deny the validity of the stuff that you've created in the field? Yeah, I think it does make things more challenging and it increases the need um, for media to be able to track you know, chain of custody and then also um, establish provenance and verification and authentication. Um, I think that for us, like what one of our main goals is in building that tool is making sure that we have the capacity to establish that kind of chain of custody and that uh, it empowers journalists, citizen journalists, to be able to advocate for their own media in the face of bad actors or others who are, are tampering with or um, changing their, their forms of media. Um, but it definitely is an ongoing issue for us that we feel like we're constantly having to kind of adapt a lot of our documentation work and trainings um, to account for kind of the implementation and deployment of the technology based on the specific context of the region. So I actually, I love this question because, you know, this I, there's this kind of, you know, this idea that like, there's this problem that, you know, people are doubting the news, people are doubting what they see. And it's really interesting to me. So I, I you know, I, I mentioned that I studied math. And so Rene Descartes is the philosopher and mathematician who coined the phrase cogito ergo sum, which means I think therefore I am. He's also famous for the Cartesian coordinate system. Um, but, you know, he, he said, I think therefore I am, but if you actually read, you know, the, the book and the post, the, the book that was published posthumously, which kind of included his writings leading up to that concept, he actually starts off by saying, dudo ergo cognito ergo sum. So he says, I doubt, therefore I think, therefore I am. Or what he actually says is, I doubt, therefore I am, which is a way of, I think, therefore I am. And then it was summarized, I doubt, therefore I think, therefore I am. And so I think, you know, instead of framing it as like we have this problem of people doubting, we should frame it as we have a collective consciousness of people seeking knowledge. Um, and, you know, we're just, our, we're being pushed to help people verify their knowledge, which is a good thing. It's good that people are questioning what they see and, you know, trying to find better ways of proving what they see instead of just accepting what they see at face value. Because when you accept what you see at face value without questioning it, without doubting yourself, that's how you fall victim to dogmas. That's, that's how you get wrapped into a cult. Like, you actually want people to doubt things. Um, and so instead of, you know, kind of, you know, fearing this doubt, we, you know, I feel like with proof mode, we actually kind of honor this doubt of like, yes, like this doubt is actually very important. You have a valid reason for doubting. And we're going to do our best to minimize doubt. You know, I say minimize because we, you know, I, I, I feel like with the consistent threat models that arise every day, we don't say we remove doubt completely, but you know, we're working towards minimizing doubt. So, you know, one of the ways that proof mode works is um, when you use the application, it takes a hash of the photo um, that you took and then puts that hash on blockchain. And now, you know, we're using open time and now you can say like, well, this photo existed at this exact time. And, you know, and then, you know, there's, you know, great ways that the hash works of, you know, if, if you change a single pixel of that photo, the hash will be different when you try to run that hash again. Um, so again, we're minimizing doubt. There are ways around it, you know, or, you know, if somebody took, takes a photo of a photo, you know, it, they're, we're, we're trying to minimize doubt. Um, and, but we're also honoring the fact that doubt is an important part of the knowledge process. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting angle. Um, Doubting is good, um, and, and I, I feel like 
the, the journalists will work with fall into two camps. There are people who feel the trust should be in the institutions and the journalistic process, and we don't really need to make any changes. Uh, another camp falls into like, no, we should actually just kind of show them transparently how things are done. One example is uh, photojournalists. They would uh, routinely edit the images um, for to to actually reflect reality better. Um, sometimes you take a you take a photo, the color doesn't actually match what you see with your eyes, and these kind of things are like once you do that, if you track the changes, people can claim, hey, you altered reality when they actually made it closer to reality, and so like there's also like this consumer education angle when people are reading this stuff, how are you like um, how are you processing these these these, these change these changes? Is it good that we're re revealing more information, or does it actually give more service for people to doubt? Um, so so that's one one thing. Another one is um, in um, journalistic processes. There are information that has to be uh, obfuscated uh, for safety reasons. The exact location of a, of a, of, a, of someone's home. Um, that sort of information. How do you review? How do you do like selective revealing of, of uh, metadata of information in, in the process? And the fact that you redacted something does that mean you have something to hide? So these are like we don't we don't have answers to these questions. Uh, we're we're more building the technology and servicing these questions um, so that, that enable these things to be done at all. So most of the, most of the work that we do, we treat them as prototypes that open up conversations. I'm going to cheekily see if I've got just time for one more because related to that, um, do you, this kind of stuff is currently kind of niche and needs your apps and your tools to do it. Do you see uh, this technology kind of being built into everyone's smartphones and everyone's cameras so there's a sort of chain of custody built into the metadata formats for the pictures in the future? And then what's the impact of that on the kind of issues that you were describing? So I think in theory, yes. Um, I think that there would need to be a little bit more like analysis of what are the downstream effects of some of the ways in which decentralized technologies are used. I think one thing that comes up for us a lot is like usability, accessibility, um, and like the downside of permanence, right? Like when we talk about permanence as though it's often it's kind of posed as a feature, but I think there's also um, kind of high risk when you think about using it in terms of like documenting war crimes, documenting violence, documenting harm. Um, so I think there's, there's still a lot of questions that need to be answered. Um, how can you make, you know, these technologies um, user friendly to the best of like the ability of, of the general user, not just somebody who has a technical background or who has information on how to navigate these things. Um, so I, I think that the in theory it's like a great idea, but that there would need to be kind of a, a much deeper analysis about what types of decentralized technologies are going to be the best fits for which audiences and realizing that um, the features and roles may not necessarily be net positive in every single case um, and may need to be tailored to specific uses. Yeah, um, so, you know, the examples that I, you know, think of is that um, it used to be that, you know, activists, you know, would use, you know, people in general would use SMS technology um, to send me messages to each other. And then people would realize that, you know, that can be intercepted by the police, it can be intercepted by stingrays. Um, and so as the safety features come to, you know, fruition, um, or as these safety issues come to, you know, yeah, come to fruition, um, now, you know, we see this kind of steady move over to end-to-end -end encrypted messaging systems, you know, to Signal, to Telegram. Um, and, you know, it's not everybody using it, like my dad doesn't use Signal. Uh, I would like him to, I should encourage him to more. Um, but, you know, we are starting to see this shift and it's starting to become more normalized, even among just the average person, not necessarily just amongst the activists and journalists. Signal is being used by tons of people, Telegram is being used by tons of people. Um, and so I feel like we can see this kind of shift, you know, over time of, you know, collect as, you know, people come become collectively conscious of the fact that, you know, privacy matters and veracity matters. Um, I, I do think we would see these shifts over time. Um, that, that's a good example of end-to-end uh, -end encryption. I, I think the coverage, like the adoption is actually pretty high, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, I wonder if like content provenance would, people would like do that 
for all the photographs, like all, all the things that they capture would have some sort of um, like hash and signature attached to it. Um, I, I think in the, th there's, a, there's a community um, around the standard called C2PA. Um, and it's also like implemented in like Adobe Photoshop, for example, to track changes in photos. Um, one of the questions that came up is, hey, like if there is a concept of authenticated photos, um, images, then does that make everything else unauthenticated and therefore like it's not trustworthy? So I, I think like um, we may, f f for the same reason that end-to-end -end encryption comes with um, um, new ways of harm, new ways of, of new risks, uh, when we actually adopt more broadly uh, content provenance, we would also have some, some of these uh, things come up. Um, yeah, does that? Yeah, that was great. Guys, thank you so much for all your amazing work and being on time to this panel and to everyone else. <laughs> Sorry, that was great. Thanks very much. <laughs>